Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We studied the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, <laughs> and this series is on the book of Isaiah, and of course that includes a lot of information about the man Isaiah himself. This lesson is entitled, The Hard Way. It's lesson four in that series for January 23 of 2021, and as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we bow before you once again, recognizing your presence with us and looking at these passages of Scripture, these verses from Scripture, trying to determine what you wanted us to learn from these passages. There's, there's such a limited amount of space in Scripture, yet you d d decided to allow your prophets to write these words, so let us take them for what they mean is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Well, in last week's lesson, we talked about some of the sad things that uh, Ahaz did. We're going to go. We're going to dive deeper into that in this lesson. This lesson will focus particularly on the very sad behavior and its results. One of the kings of Judah, Ahaz, his rebellion against God and his refusal to cooperate with the prophet Isaiah. How should God deal with people who refuse to listen to His advice? Should He burn them forever? Oh, that sounds like a good idea, right? Does our story in this lesson teach us anything about following God's advice? So let's start off with the key verses. Jim? Isaiah chapter 7, verses 14 to 16. Well then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. A young woman who is pregnant will have a son and will name him Emmanuel. By the time he is old enough to make his own decisions, people will be drinking milk and eating honey. Even before that time comes, the lands of those two kings who terrify you will be deserted. But American Bible Society, 1992, Good News Translation. These verses were God's response to King Ahaz's refusal to be guided by the prophet Isaiah's message from the Lord. He was told clearly that the two kings, Rezin and Pekah, from Syria and Israel respectively, would not be able to overcome his kingdom or attack Jerusalem. But as we studied last week, instead of accepting God's word, he had a plan of his own. Carrie? Uh, I'm reading from chapter 7 of Isaiah, verses 1 to 9. When King Ahaz, the son of Jotham and grandson of Isaiah, ruled Judah, War broke out. Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, son of Remalia, king of Israel, attacked Jerusalem, but were unable to capture it. When word reached the king of Judah that the armies of Syria were already in the territory of Israel, he and all his people were so terrified they trembled like trees shaking in the wind. The Lord said to Isaiah, Take your son, Shear Jashub, and go to meet King Ahaz. You will find him on the road where the cloth makers work at the end of the ditch that brings water from the upper pool. Tell him to keep alert, to stay calm, and not to be frightened or disturbed. The anger of King Rezan and his Syrians and of King Beaker is no more dangerous than the smoke from two smoldering sticks. Syria, together with Israel and its king, has made a plot. They intend to invade Judah, terrify the people into joining, the, joining their side, and then put Tabil's son on the throne. But I, the Lord, declare that this will never happen. Why? Because Syria is no stronger than Damascus, its capital city, and Damascus is no stronger than King Rezin. As for Israel, within 65 years, it will be too shattered to survive as a nation. Israel is no stronger than Samaria, its capital city, and Samaria is no stronger than King Pekah. If your faith is not enduring, you will not endure from the Good News Bible. So after giving him some pretty clear and promising news about what's going to happen to his enemies, he turns to him and he says, if your faith is not enduring, you will not endure. Yeah. So, bang, look what happened to the king of Assyria. Uh, Assyria, I'm sorry. Look what was going to happen to the king of Israel. And you? What's going to happen to you? 
Well, we're not going to read all these verses, but in 2 Kings 15, 29 to 30, and 2 Kings 16, 7 to 9, and 1 Chronicles 5, 6, and 26, it is possible to determine very precisely the historical background under which these events took place. Now, of course, when you say very precisely, what we're really saying is this gives you a chance to link to, to data which we can gather from archaeological sources and so forth to nail down these dates. Charles, you want to tell us about that? This prophecy of Isaiah was given about 734 BC. So this is about 60 plus years before Babylon. Babylon came in six, very first time Babylon conquered Israel, or Judah rather, was 605 BC. Right. So this is 130 years yeah. before Hun that. 130 years going down. Yeah, because six, 734, 734 to, right. da, 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 down to 605. Yeah, I was doing the other way. <laughs> okay, in response to the Bible of uh, the bribe, bribe of uh, Ahaz, Tiglath Pilsar III did what he probably would have done anyway. Yeah. He smashed the northern coalition, conquered the Galilee and Transjordanian region of the northern Israel, deported some of the population and turn the territories into Assyrian provinces. Okay, let me let me interrupt here for just a second. When he says he, he, he conquered Galilee and the Transjordanian Jordanian regions of northern Israel, what were the Transjordanian regions of northern Israel? Uh, Tyre and Sidon area? Or? No, that would be they, Tyre and Sidon were there a, was a separate it's kingdom. Lebanon. No. Well, Go ahead, Web, and, uh... well, remember that when the children of Israel came into the land of Canaan, first of all, they conquered those two, I'll put, put it this way for you, they conquered those two northern kingdoms, Og and, and Bashan. Bashan and so forth, those two places, and the, the tribes of uh, Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh said, this looks like beautiful country, great for our animals and so forth, let us stay here. So that, on the east side of that's Jordan. on the east side of Jordan. So that's the Transjordanian territory, and for, for hundreds of years, it was a part of Israel. And so now the king comes, I mean, um, Syrian king comes down and just conquers that. Is that still a problem today? <laughs> Is that what kind of Have you ever... Remember ever reading any, anything in the news about the Golan Heights? Oh, yes. Well, there it is, right in the middle. This is exactly what we're talking about right here. Yeah, yeah. Well, in 67 war, <laughs> it says we will never give that up. Yep. And, so and why not? Why, why is Israel re absolutely refusing? Because they're up on top and yeah, shooting exactly. down. Yeah, so. from the Golan Heights, you can look over the entire Ga Sea of Galilee. The all, everything, look, it's one of the most profitable, I mean, it's one of the most agriculturally profitable areas in all of Israel. So if you're standing up there and controlling the guns from there, you see every move. Israel has no prayer. So yeah. when they got it in that five-day war, right? Yeah, six-day war. Six-day war, right, right. So we'll yeah. never give this up. So... <clears throat> This is, this is ancient history, but it's also modern history. The remainder of Israel was saved when Hosea, after... Now, do be careful here. This is not Hosea, the Ros biblical prophet. This right, is right. Hosea, Hosea, the, the, the king, the bad king. Spelling is different. After murdering King Pekah, surrendered and paid tribute. In 733 and 732 B.C., Tiglath-Pilzer, conquered Damascus, the capital of Syria. Then he made Syria into Assyrian provinces. So by 732, within about two years of Isaiah's prediction, Syria and Israel had been conclusively defeated, and it was all over for the two kings who had threatened Ahaz. Now, it's, it, was only, it wasn't until about ten years later that they actually finally conquered Samaria itself, the capital of the northern kingdom. But they had already overrun the northern kingdom, you know, ten years before that. Okay? Soon after, Shalmaneser, Shalmaneser, Shalmaneser the, the fifth. fifth, replaced Tiglath Pilser, Pilser III in 727 BC, King Hosea, is that how he pronounced mm -hmm. it? Hosea of Israel, 
committed political suicide by rebelling against Assyria. The Assyrians took the capital of the city of uh, Samaria in 722. And that's the one I was talking about just a moment ago. They sieged that city for about two and a half years before they finally captured it. Did, was it well walled like was Jerusalem then? Huh? Was that Lachish? No. No, no, Lachish is part of part Judah. South, okay. That's part of Judah. This is this is the capital of the northern kingdom. So it was a well walled city as yeah. well. So yeah. and deported thousands of Israelites to Mesopotamia and Media. This is Media Persia? Media? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Where uh, they were absorbed into the local populations eventually and lost their identity. Ah, that's sad. Yep. This is uh, Isaiah 7, uh, 8. Within 65 years of Ephraim would no longer even be a people. God had predicted what uh, would uh, happen. Let me interrupt for a second. What do we mean by that? What the Assyrians did, each one of these ancient nations had a way of trying to prevent any rebellion. And the Assyrians' version of how to prevent rebellion is when you conquer a nation, scatter the people that you, you take, just a few here and a few there and a few here, just scatter them all over the place so there's no chance for them to sort of get together and, and plan a rebellion. And so, as we know, the ten tribes, which we're talking about here, the ten tribes of the north, completely just disappeared into history. We never hear from them ever again. When they scattered them, they also intermarry. So oh, they yeah. lose their identity. Yeah, That's exactly. What he's yeah, talking about. Yeah. Um, okay. So God had predicted. We? God had predicted what would happen to the enemies of Judah, but His point to Ahaz was that He would uh, that this would happen anyway, without the need of relying on uh, Assyria. Adult Sabbath School Class Study Guide, uh, Sunday for Sunday, January the 16th. It's hard for us who live in relatively comfortable security in our day to imagine what it would be like to live in a nation where there was a constant threat of war and death from your enemies living a few miles away. I mean, the, ki the northern kingdom of Israel was about no more than 10 miles from the border, well, from Jerusalem, from the border of, of the southern kingdom. And it, it was overrun by the Assyrians, and there they are. Hi! <laughs> you know? But there is plenty of evidence from Scripture that God's faithful people will face terrible events in the future, including the possibility of being killed. Read the book of Revelation. Isaiah continued his prophecy by telling them exactly what was going to happen, Isaiah 7, 17 through 25, the Lord is going to bring on you, on your people, and on the whole royal family, days of trouble worse than any that have come since the kingdom of Israel separated from Judah. He is going to bring the king of Assyria, not Syria, Assyria. When that time comes, the Lord will whistle as a signal for the Egyptians to come from, like flies from the farthest branches of the Nile, and for the Assyrians to come from their land like bees. They will swarm in the rugged valleys and in the caves and the rocks, and they will cover every thorn bush and every pasture. In that so, time, yeah? So uh, Egypt is coming from south, and Assyria Egypt, from the north. North-west a little bit? or North-east a little bit. North-east. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Southwest and northeast. When that time comes, the Lord will hire a barber from across the Euphrates, the emperor of Assyria, and he will shave off your beards and the hair of your heads and your bodies. When that time comes, even if a farmer has been able to save only one young cow and two goats, they will give so much milk that he will have all he needs. Yes, the few survivors left in the land will have milk and honey to eat. So, when that time comes, the fine vineyards, each with a thousand vines and each worth a thousand pieces of silver, will be overgrown with thorn bushes and briars. People will go hunting with, there with bows and arrows. Yes, the whole country will be full of briars and thorn bushes. All, all the hills where crops used to grow will be so overgrown with thorns that no one will go there. It will be a place where cattle and sheep graze. From the Good News Bible. You were saying that it's even to this day it's similar. Yeah. 
Wow. God predicted to Isaiah a time of terrible devastation with almost nothing of value left. Jim? Invitation upon invitation was sent to Aryan Israel to return to their allegiance to Jehovah. Tender were the pleadings of the prophets, and as they stood before the people, earnestly exhorting them, exhorting to repentance and reformation, their words bore fruit to the glory of God. Ellen White, Prophets and Kings, pages, page 325, paragraph 1. So, in the midst of all that terrible stuff, a few people from Judah did choose to follow God's advice. And the, the example I give, which came 100 years later, 130 years later, is the story of Daniel and his three friends. I mean, the situation was just as bad in Judah, maybe worse than it is here in Israel, and yet, look at those four young men, just, you know, absolutely loyal to the, to the commands of God and following God's advice, and they stood up to the Babylonian conquerors. They were the number one health reformers. Yeah. So a few people from Judah did choose to follow God's advice. And Daniel and his three friends were descendants of those people, I'm sure. But we see that there was good news and bad news for Ahaz. The good news was that his two immediate enemies, Israel and Syria, would cease to exist. But the bad news was that the Assyrians from Nineveh, who had conquered both of those countries, were planning to conquer him. So why do you suppose Ahaz thought that by sending some money to tiglath pileser of Assyria, he would protect himself and his kingdom? I mean, what's he doing? He's just paying for the armies to come and conquer him. King Ahaz actually traveled to Damascus, the capital of Syria, to meet Emperor tiglath pileser of Assyria after he had captured Damascus. Look at what happened at that time. So here's the, here is our charming friend Ahaz traveling to the, the capital of the nation that he is so worried about conquering him. And he's going there to meet tiglath pileser He bows down to him. And what happened? I'm reading from 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 10 through 18. When King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Emperor tiglath pileser he saw the altar there and sent back to Uriah the priest an exact model of it down to the smallest details. So Uriah built an altar just like it and finished it before Ahaz returned. On his return from Damascus, Ahaz saw that the altar was finished. So he burnt animal sacrifices and grain offerings on it and poured a wine offering and the blood of a fellowship offering on it. The bronze altar dedicated to the Lord was between the new altar and the temple. So Ahaz moved it to the north side of his new altar. Okay, let's hold on here for a second. <clears throat> if you remember the, the, the pictures, that the artist's conceptions of what the tabernacle looked like, including the, the Solomon's temple, here is the, the, the bronze altar, I mean the bronze altar out here, and then there's the laver where they wash themselves, and then there's the, the, the gate to the, to the holy place. So what is, what's he doing here? He's saying, get these things from the Lord out of here, move them out of the way, I'm putting in my new, I mean, this is just, yeah. Who, uh, Hophni and Phinehas? Hophni and Phinehas were the Phineas, ones who, right, they who were... took the ark, in the, back in the days of Samuel, right. they took that ark and took it down into war against the Philistines. They thought they, were, they thought they could force God to fight for them by taking the altar down there, and of course they lost it. They, and they, they were killed? Uh, who were yeah. they, uh, they were they both killed. killed. They, right. Um, I mean, sometimes the Lord gives the judgment right there. Uh, yeah. Someone else, two sons of, were they Samuel, perhaps, that were... Doing pretty the, awful things. Right, right. And th I think th it was the two, two kids that were yeah. also judged yep. right in the spot. And then he uh. ordered Uriah, use this large altar of mine for the morning burnt offerings and the evening grain offerings, for the burnt offerings and grain offerings of the king and the people, and for people's wine offerings. 
Pour on it the blood of all the animals that are sacrificed, but keep the bronze altar for me to use for divination. Uriah did as the king commanded. So imagine this now. He yeah. says, take God's altar, move it over there, use this big fancy new one here for all the regular offerings and so forth, but I'll use this one over here that is one approved of God. <laughs> this is just... You see, it looks, it looks like insanity from our perspective. Divination, isn't that where he's getting involved with the spirits? Yep, mm -hmm. exactly. It's even worse. Go ahead. King Ahaz took apart the bronze carts used in the temple and removed the basins that were on them. He also took the bronze tank from the backs of the twelve bronze bulls and placed it on a stone foundation. And in order to please the Assyrian emperor, Ahaz also removed from the temple the platform for the royal throne and closed up the, king, the king's rather private entrance to the temple. And that's from the Good News Bible. Yeah. Now, I, you, you, you sanctuary experts, where's the private's king entrance to the temple? I don't know. <laughs> it's not to the holy place or the most holy place. No, this is to one of the outside areas, yeah. Yeah, but here he's, he's saying that just to try to keep peace with the Assyrians who eventually are going to come and overrun him, uh, you know, just to try to keep with it. Oh, if you want it that way, King, oh yeah, fine, whatever you, whatever you say, whatever you say, I mean. <laughs> um, what is the king's entrance? Where is the king's entrance? Yeah. We don't know exactly. It's probably on the north side. It's a separate... Plate. I mean, it's like you go to you go to uh, England. There's a, s a separate entrance for the Queen to enter the Parliament. Parliament, right? Yeah, right. like that. Yes. Well, clearly, sending money to Tiglath Pileser did not protect Judah at all. And what did Ahaz do after visiting Emperor Tiglath Pileser? Second. Uh, Second Charles? Chronicle 28, 20 to 25, the Assyrian emperor, instead of helping Ahaz, opposed him and caused him trouble. So Ahaz took the gold from the temple, the palace, and the homes of the leaders of the people and gave it to the emperor. But even this did not help. Mm. <laughs> when, <laughs> when his troubles were at their worst, that man Ahaz sinned against the Lord more than ever. He offered sacrifices to the gods of the Syrians who had defeated him. He said, the Syrian gods helped the king, uh, kings of Syria, so I sacrifice to them. If I sacrifice. Yeah. If I sacrifice. So if I sacrifice to them, they may help me. This brought disaster on him and on his nation. In addition, he took all the temple equipment and broke it in pieces. Ah. He closed the temple and set up the altars in every part of Jerusalem. In every city and town in Judah, he built pagan places of worship where incense was to be burned to foreign gods. In this way, he brought on himself the anger of the Lord, the God of his ancestors. Good news, Bible. So was, he was obviously being defiant. Yeah, oh yeah, directly defiant. Yeah, absolutely. Most of the time. Considering what the Assyrians were doing at that time in history, it should not be hard for us to realize that Ahaz was scared to death. But instead of trusting himself and his nation in the hands of the God of his ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he tried to convince tiglath pileser to leave him alone by sending a lot of money. <laughs> did it work? Nope. It certainly did not work. Isaiah 8, 1-10, we're, we're getting the sequence, the whole... Section, a bunch of verses here. The Lord said to me, Take a large piece of writing material and write on it in large letters, Quick loot, fast plunder. Get two reliable men, the priest Uriah and Zechariah son of Jeberechiah, to serve as witnesses. Sometime later, so what's he doing here? He's announcing with a big, some kind of a, what would be a placard or a, a, a sign out, outside the, the road here. He's saying, his wife's not even pregnant yet. He's announcing in, in advance that this son, whose name should have been Emmanuel, because the king has rebelled against God, his name is going to be Quick Loot Fast Plunder. <laughs> Sometime later, my wife became pregnant. 
When our son was born, the Lord said to me, Name him Quick Loot Fast Plunder. Before the boy is old enough to say, Mummy and Daddy, all the wealth of Damascus and all the loot of Samaria will be carried off by the king of Assyria. The Lord spoke to me again. He said, Because these people have rejected the quiet waters from the brook of Shaloa and trembled before King Rezin and King Pekah, I, the Lord, will bring the emperor of Assyria and all his forces to attack Judah. They will advance like the flood waters of the river Euphrates, overflowing all its banks. They will sweep through Judah in a flood, rising shoulder high and covering everything. God is with us. His outspread wings protect the land. Gather together in fear, you nations. Listen, you distant parts of the earth. Get ready to fight, but be afraid. Yes, get ready, but be afraid. Make your plans, but they will never succeed. Talk as much as you like, but it is all useless because God is with us. Good news Bible. So remember, just to look forward in history, because we can do that now, because we're way down the line. When the Assyrians attacked Judah, what happened? How successful were they? They conquered everything except Jerusalem itself. And remember, that's the point at which Hezekiah went to Isaiah, and they went to the temple, and they prayed, God, there's nothing we can do here. It's up to you. And then what did God do? He, he, one night, one angel, perhaps, mm -hmm. 185,000 of them, and then Senator of himself was killed, I think, when yep. he went back by his own son. He, yeah, Sennacherib, Sennacherib went, back to his, went back to Damascus, fled back to Damascus, and one of his sons killed him, assassinated him. Damascus or Nineveh? Nineveh. Nineveh. I'm sorry, did I say Damascus? I'm sorry, Nineveh. In our last lesson, we suggested that this baby known as Mehershal al-Hashbaz was actually the one who was supposed to be called Emmanuel. But because of the king's refusal to accept God's guidance, the power of God could not work for him. The poor baby boy ended up with a name meaning quick loot, fast plunder. In some translations, it is translated as swift as booty, speedy as prey. But it is important to notice that even in these verses lived out by Isaiah and his family, there was a promise that, and the older son was named what? A remnant shall return. At the beginning of our studies on Isaiah, we suggested that Isaiah is sometimes known as the gospel prophet. This theme that God would eventually come to a future descendant of David and rule God's people forever is a central theme in the book of Isaiah. I just wanted to point to something. Yeah. Um, Ahaz was perhaps the, one of the worst kings of Judah, just like his counterpart in Ahab mm -hmm, yeah. in Northern Kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a horrible, horrible king. Yeah. However, look at what had happened out of this horribly evil palace comes a son, perhaps one of the best in, yeah. uh, in Judah. Yeah. Hezekiah. His son was Hezekiah, one of the best kings. Yes. So now, let's ask a question. What was the point of announcing widely to the population that his wife was going to have a son with that strange name? She's not even pregnant yet. And he puts up a big bill for it, saying, my wife is going to have a son, and this is going to be his name. Did any of the people know that the boy's name was supposed to have been Emmanuel? Were, they, were there any faithful people in Judah by trying to appeal to Ahaz to change his ways? There must have been some. Anyone other than Isaiah? It is clear throughout Scripture that God is always willing to take us back if we are willing to come back. Yeah. What do we have next here? I guess this is me. No? <clears throat> Isaiah, uh, chapter 8, verses 11 to 15. With his great power, the Lord warned me not to follow the path which the people were following. He said... Do not join in the schemes of the people and do not be afraid of the things that they fear. Remember that I, the Lord Almighty, am holy. I am the one who you must fear. Because of my awesomeness, awesome holiness, I am like a stone that the people stumble over. I am like a trap that will catch the people of the kingdoms of Judah and Israel and the people of Jerusalem. Many will stumble, they will fall and be crushed, they will be caught in a trap. Good wow. news, Bible. 
In these verses, it seems that God found it necessary to encourage even Isaiah not to give up. Certainly there was reason from a human standpoint to be afraid. Try to imagine trying to, uh, trying to sleep at night, realizing that at any moment an enemy might come in and destroy you and your family and your entire nation. But fear itself can be a disabling force. In his first inaugural address on March 4, 1933, American President Franklin D. Roosevelt told a nation disheartened by the Great Depression, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Isaiah's message to his depressed people was, we have nothing to fear when we fear God himself. A little different, right? It's important to understand that the word fear in the Bible, both in Hebrew and in Greek, can refer to a full range of emotions from absolute terror all the way to respect and honor. The context must determine what the biblical word means in a given situation. A clear example of this is in Revelation 14, 6 and 7, and that's our famous one of our famous Adventist texts. Then I saw another angel flying high on the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples on the earth to every nation race tribe language and nation he said in a loud voice and my good news bible says honor god but in the original literally it's the word fear god and praise his greatness for the time has come for him to judge worship him who made heaven earth sea and the springs of water so do you think god is telling us to be afraid of him or is he telling us to honor him it says an eternal message of good news yeah so, exactly. Uh, to be in awe of God is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. Well, someone who says very quickly, someone who says, come now, let us reason together. Right. There's nothing to be afraid of. I think. Yeah, that's for education. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. teaching. Yeah. yeah. So our first angel's message, look at it in several different translations if you have a question about it, and you'll see how differently the word fear has been translated. But in that context, how do we understand fear in 1 John 4, 18? The same one who at Revelation wrote 1 John along with the Gospel of John and the, those three short letters. And 1 John 4, 18 says what, Carrie? There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out all fear. So then love has not been made perfect in anyone who is afraid because fear has to do with punishment. Okay. So, good Go news Bible. So where, where do you, what, what version of fear do you think it's talking about there? Is this honor and respect, or is this something else? There is no fear in love. Well, if, if yeah. everybody ultimately ends up where they're quaking in their boots, God's message is impotent. Yeah, yeah. That is what, God's trying to educate people. Uh, <laughs> I like the phrase, God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. Mm -hmm. Just because something happened doesn't necessarily mean that God's doing it He's, as, as an active agent. We're going to be talking about that in a few minutes here. Compare Proverbs 9 verse 10 in these two different translations. From the King James, well, from the Good News Bible first, to be wise you must first have reference for the Lord. Reverence for the Lord. If you know the Holy One, you have understanding. But if you look at uh, the next translation, Carrie? I'm, I'm sorry, not Carrie. That should be Charles, right? Yes, Proverbs uh, 9. Proverbs 9, 10. To be wise, you must first have reverence for the Lord. If you know the Holy One, you have understanding. All right? That's Good News Bible. Proverbs 9, 10. This is, next one is Holy Bible, the New Revised Standard Version. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is in sight. Aye. It's, it's the beginning. Very, it isn't the ultimate goal. Yeah. yeah. That. Could you make that distinction? Yes. Yeah, we, we start off by, by being respectful, yeah. by honoring, the realizing God is way above us. So to a small child, that might be you know, a little bit afraid, maybe. But as we grow and as we understand, it's not like that anymore. The, the phrase, sullen submission produces the character of a rebel. Right. Yeah. And uh, God doesn't want you to be quaking in your boots. He wants to come now, let us reason together, Isaiah. Yeah. And when you get over to the New Testament, he says, I want to be your friends. Yeah. 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 Well, notice what Isaiah says next. Isaiah 8, verses 16 to 22. 
You, my disciples, are to guard and preserve the messages that God has given me. The Lord has hidden himself from his people, but I trust him and place my hope in him. Here I am with the children the Lord has given me. The Lord Almighty, whose throne is on Mount Zion, has sent us as, as living messages to the people of Israel. You know, imagine, you know, you go to the marketplace, here you are with the, and the mom is here at the marketplace with her kids, and the other lady says, oh, this is your son? Yeah, what's his name? A remnant shall return. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Wow. But people will tell you to ask for messages from fortune tellers and mediums who chirp and mutter. They will say, after all, people should ask for messages from the spirits and consult the dead on behalf of the living. You are to answer them. Listen to what the Lord is teaching you. Don't listen to mediums. What they tell you cannot, cannot keep trouble away. The people will wander through the land, discouraged and hungry, and their hunger and their anger, they will curse their king and their God. They may look up to the sky and or stare at the ground, but they will see nothing but trouble and darkness, terrifying darkness into which they are being driven. One of the important factors leading to Ahaz's deadly decision was his connection with the occult practices which he had adopted from the nations around him. It became so serious that he sacrificed his own son, or maybe even sons, as a burnt offering to idols. Why would someone do that? <laughs> it is obviously true that Isaiah's description of the despair and the evils that Ahaz did fits him well. And when Ahaz finally died, they did not even bury him in the area reserved for kings, Second Chronicles 28-27. But isn't the occult something from long ago that does not involve us in any day, in our day? Notice God's instructions about dealing with the occult all the way back in the days of Moses. Jim? Leviticus 20, 27. Any man or woman who com consults spirits of the dead shall be stoned to death. Any person who does this is responsible for his own death. I can, let me interrupt for a second. You might, we, we, we might be inclined to say, well, that's, you know, this, you know, occult stuff, that's from a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Just a few days ago, in our, our last Sabbath school class, we had a lady here who's been trying to reach out to some of her neighbors and people we work, she works with to try to spread the gospel a little bit, making an honest effort. And this lady said to her, I'm sorry. I speak to my dead mother every few days and she keeps me in line. Mm. Yeah. Right here. Right here. Yeah. Right here. Well, th that uh, head of the, uh, one of the co-founders of uh, BLM, mm -hmm. a guy by the name of Colors, formerly a Jehovah's Witness, or raised a Jehovah's Witness, mm -hmm. she c communicates with her d dead relatives. Yeah. Oh, th yeah. This, is, this is getting pretty close to home. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Carrie? I'm reading from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, don't follow the disgust. Let me start disgusting again. Practices of the nations that are there. Don't sacrifice your children in the fires on your altars. Mm. Don't let your people practice divination or look for omens or use spells or charms. And don't let them consult the spirits of the dead. The Lord your God hates people who do these disgusting things, and that is why he is driving those nations out of the land as you advance. Be completely faithful to the Lord. That's from Good News Bible. Yeah. One very sad example of a king who got involved with the occult is the story of King Saul. Jib, here you go. Let's talk about this. Charles? Yeah, it's me. Um, the Philistines fought a battle against the Israelites on Mount This Gilboa. is First Chronicles 10, 1 to 14. Yes. That's, this is in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Right. Many Israelites were killed there, and the rest of them, including King Saul and his sons, fled. But the Philistines caught up with them and killed three of the sons of uh, Saul's son, Jonathan, David's best friend. Mm-hmm. 
Abinadab and Mount Chishua. The fighting was heavy around Saul and he was hit by enemy arrows and badly wounded. He said to the young man carrying his weapons, draw your sword and kill me to keep these godless Philistines from gloating over me. But the young man was too terrified to do it. To do it. And so Saul took his own sword and threw himself on it. The young man saw that Saul was dead, so he too threw himself on his sword and died. So Saul and his three sons all died together, and none of his descendants ever ruled. When the Israelites who lived in the valley of Jezreel heard that the army had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their towns and ran off. Then the Philistines came and occupied them. The day after the battle, the Philistines went to plunder the corpses and found the bodies of Saul and his sons lying in Mount Gilboa. They cut off Saul's head, stripped off his armor, and sent messengers with them throughout Philistia to tell the good news that their idols to their people. They put his weapons on one of their temples and hung his head in the temple of their god Dagon. Mm. When the people of Judah uh, and Gilead, Jabesh. Jabesh and Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, the bravest men went and fletched the bodies of Saul and his sons and took them to Jabesh. They buried them under the oak and fasted for seven days. Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He disobeyed the Lord's commands. He tried to find guidance by consulting the spirits of the dead instead of consulting the Lord. So the Lord killed him and gave control of the kingdom to David, the son of Jesse. Good news Bible. Okay, the Lord killed him, right? <laughs> So how do you put these two versions of Saul's death together? He was wounded and then killed himself. And, quote, he died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. God killed him. It is clear that Saul committed suicide. We just read it. And you can read in 1 Samuel 31, 3 and 4, same, same passage. How could the Bible writer say, so the Lord killed him? 1 Chronicles 10, 13 and 14. God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that okay. which he allows. Okay, anything that seems to be beyond human easy explanation, they said, well, it must be God doing Something's it. Something's happening, the God or gods, and so they yeah. attribute it to... to, uh, to we, this is a side question. Do we read somewhere that um, a man came running to David? Yes, thinking, we're going to read about him in a moment okay. here. I didn't get to reading this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think the same writer, if he, if he were to describe the death of Judas Iscariot, would say, so the Lord killed him? If the same scribe could very well have done it that way. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he turned against God, and God finally have to, left him. And what happened? Well, in, in Daniel 12, 1, it says, Michael, who has your Stand protector. Up. Yeah, and that's that's a, the NIV, your protector. And when I when I heard, I'm not all of uh, uh, favorite of uh, NIV, NIV, but uh, that one is is spot on. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. your protector. But what do you do? You move you move yourself away. God yeah. lets you go. You, you yeah. said the Lord left him. Mm -hmm. Well, that could also be said that God killed Jesus. Because the Lord left, left him. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. You see, that's yeah. what really killed him. Yeah. You know. Could this statement throw any light on all the other statements about God killing people? For example, Ur and Onan. Remember J uh, Judah's sons? Genesis 38, 6-10, 1 Chronicles 2-3. What about Nadab and Abihu? Mm. You know, I'd like to go back to the Deuteronomy 18 a few minutes ago. We uh -huh. were there. Yeah. It says, don't offer your, your, your sacrifice yeah. or kill your, your kids. What do we do with uh, Abraham and Isaac? Yeah. Abraham was a pagan. <laughs> he said that was, and he got this message, and he thought that that's the way it was. God didn't, it, 
you can uh, find a translation that makes more sense than, than what we're used to. Uh, or what, what about Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? Yeah. I mean, earth opened up. Yeah. You know? Well, if, if a few years ago, earth opened up and, at, at the Corvette Museum and a bunch of Corvettes end up. <laughs> okay. What were the factors that led to the death of Saul? At the very end of his life, he fell on his sword and died. But considering what the young Amalekite man, that's where you're asking about, remember he escaped and raced over to David and said, I saw there and he was wounded and I killed him. In 2 Samuel 1, 1 to 10, said it is possible that even after falling on his sword, he was not completely dead and that young man finished the job. We just don't know. But what led to this end? Saul had been mortally wounded by the Philistines. So it would be correct also to say that he was killed by the Philistines. But we know more. If Saul had been faithful to the Lord all of his life and had been following the guidance of God and all that he did, no Philistine could have touched him or his sons. 1 Samuel 13, 13 and 14. Well, what a glorious beginning yeah. Saul had. Saul himself stated that God, Yahweh that is, had abandoned him and would not answer him. 1 Samuel 28, 6 and 15 and 14, 31 to 46. Saul had won many battles against the Philistines in the past. If God had been on his side, he could have won this battle without even fighting. So it is ultimately true that Saul died because God abandoned him. So Saul was responsible for his own death. Nowhere does the Bible say that, Saul, that Satan killed Saul. But again, we know that Satan was led away into all of his, I'm sorry, Saul was led away into all of his problems by the temptations of Satan. Often it is true that more than one factor is involved in causing something to happen. Mm -hmm. It's like a three-legged stool. Which leg holds up the stool? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which, which leg holds up the stool? Well, they all do. So here we see in the case of Saul, it was the Philistines. It was Saul himself. It was Satan. It was God. You know? Which, lead, which uh, they all do. So it is true that God killed Saul because Saul abandoned him. So God had to let him go. But Saul was the primary one responsible, and Satan certainly played his part. Do we have any occasions to be affected by the occult in our day? Hmm. It's everywhere. It is everywhere. What's one of the most popular series of books and movies going on right now? Right now, I don't Harry know. Potter. Harry Potter. Oh yes, uh, it's been going for quite a bit. quite a bit at the time, and Harry Potter, everyone. Yeah. But luckily, also, um, what's the uh, gentleman, the Adventist, uh, the the uh, oh, in in Okinawa, the Second World War. Oh. The yeah. Uh, it, uh, Desmond, Desmond Doss. Doss. Desmond Doss. Doss. Yeah. I mean, I used to travel a lot at the time, a lot in Delta. It's everyone watching that movie. Wonderful. And wonderful. I, I think that movie did more yeah. to get the name of Adventism all over the world than all our efforts put together. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, the occult is everywhere around us. In social media, in the movies, and in books. How can we protect ourselves from it? There are many people who feel like their involvement with the occult is nothing serious. It's, it's, it's only entertainment, right? Uh, Isn't that the way it is? It does, yeah, nothing, nothing serious about this entertainment, right? Well, look, I have an argument on that one. Uh, the Lord wants us to be spectacle, not spectators. There's a yes. big difference. Yep. You know, and we spend so much time to sell Bottom sometimes. line is, if you don't want the devil's wares, you don't go into his shop. Yep. Okay. <laughs> and, that's, and that's one of the main things that's going on. Right. Okay. <clears throat> it is a law. Who's got that for us? It is a law, both of the intellectual and spiritual nature, that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subject's upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which is, it, 
to which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than the standard of purity of goodness, excuse me, purity or goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain to anything more exalted. Rather, he will come, uh, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 555, paragraph 1. We have quoted that in this class many times, but now I would like to point out this statement is made in a chapter on the occult. Let's go back and look at that first, that first section again. It is a law, both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding we become changed. Mm. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subject upon which it is allowed to dwell. It, it's just entertainment, right? Nope. No, sir. Carrie, want to take that next one? Yeah. Uh... In the days of the Hebrews, there was a class of people who claimed, as do the spiritualists of today, to hold communication with the dead. But the familiar spirits, as these visitants from other worlds were called, are declared by the Bible to be the spirits of devils. And we're invited to compare Numbers 25, 1 to 3, Psalms 106, 28, 1 Corinthians 10, 20, in Revelation 16, 14. The work of dealing with familiar spirits was pronounced an abomination to the Lord and was solemnly forbidden under the penalty of death. Leviticus 19, 31, and it mentions Leviticus 20, 27. The very name of witchcraft is now held in contempt. The claim that men can hold intercourse with evil spirits is regarded as a fable of the dark angels. But spiritualism, which numbers its converts by hundreds of thousands, yea, by millions, which has made its way into scientific circles, which has invaded churches and has found favor in legislative bodies and even in the courts of kings, this mammoth deception is but a revival in a new disguise of the witchcraft condemned and prohibited of old. That's from Great Controversy, page 556, paragraph 2. One of the verses that is covered in this lesson, which we have often quote, which we often quote to support our belief in the scriptures, is Isaiah 8.20. Notice how differently this verse gets translated in several newer versions. Charles? But of course... I like King James because that's what I memorized <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I was a little kid. To the law and to the testament, this is Isaiah 8.20. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The Holy Bible, King James Version, 2009. Okay. Um, next one. This is, is Young's Literal. Young's Literal, yeah, translation. Is this the Young's Concordance we used to go through yeah. before to same? To the law and to the testimony, if not, let them say after this manner that there is no dawn to it. That's what it literally says. Hmm. Okay, read on. Isaiah 8, 20, this is, next one is... Uh, New Revised Standard. New Revised Standard Version. Okay, for teaching and for instructions. For teaching and for instruction, surely those who speak like this will have no dawn. The Holy okay. Bible, New River Standard Version, and uh, our Good News National, Bible. Good News Bible. You are to answer them. Listen to what the Lord is teaching you. Don't listen to the mediums. What they tell you cannot keep trouble away. Wow. I like to put the Revelation twelve nine in that one too. Yeah. You know the the deceiver of the whole world. Yeah. The devil. Mm. And the footnote says, verse 20 in Hebrew is unclear. We just don't know what some of those words are supposed to mean. In the very difficult times in which Isaiah lived under the control of Ahaz, the wicked demon-worshipping king, we find Isaiah giving warning messages of various kinds, including the names of his own children. Last week we discussed the dual application of Isaiah 7.14, 
we will not repeat that now. Try to imagine how you would feel as a prophet of God, relying totally upon his messages, if you received a message that two other nations in the area where, where you live were going to be totally destroyed and overrun by a foreign power. In those days, it was Assyria. Isaiah was told that the enemy would come in like a swarm of bees or even flies. Although we have not mentioned those nations earlier, it seems that Egypt, the Edomites, and the Philistines all had plans to attack Judah. Jim? Second Chronicles 28, 16-18. The Edomites began to raid Judah again and captured many prisoners. So King Ahaz asked Tiglath Pileser, the emperor of Assyria, to send help. Oh, At this same time, the Philistines were raiding the towns in the western foothills and in southern Judah. They captured the cities of Beth Shemesh, Ijalon, and Gedaroth, Gedaroth, and the city of Soko, Timna, and Gimzo with their villages and settled there permanently. Okay, so what's happening? These other nations are taking big chunks of Judah and just, at, you know, taking them to be a part of their nation. How would you like to have been the wife of Isaiah, who herself was called a prophetess uh, because she gave birth to sons with prophetic names? Were she and her children booed by their associates? Did anyone take their names seriously? Were they scorned? No matter how they were treated, the prophecies given by Isaiah proved to be true to the letter. Before the younger son with that name, which is the longest name of anyone in the Bible, was old enough to say mommy or daddy, the nations of which King Ahaz had been so frightened were gone and destroyed. And yet God said in Isaiah 8.8 8, that God would still be the, with the faithful of Egypt. So what did Ahaz do as the conditions got worse? He took more money from the temple of God. And I'm dropping down. Did Ahaz just think that Isaiah was lying? How did he feel about Isaiah? Did he try to run away whenever he saw Isaiah coming? But in Judah there dwelt some who maintained their allegiance to Jehovah, steadfastly refusing to be led into idolatry. It was to these that Isaiah and Micah and their associates looked in hope as they surveyed the ruin wrought during the last years of Ahaz. Their sanctuary was closed, but the faithful ones were assured, God is with us. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread, and he shall be a sanctuary. If you scan through the records of the kings of Judah and Israel, you'll notice that almost always the people followed the direction taken by the king. Why do you think that was? Are there any parallels in our day? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what an incredible bunch of events we're reading about here in the early years of Isaiah. Imagine living through that yourself and, and, and having all these things happen to you. To, to, to see that your nation was going to fall to the Assyrians just because you couldn't convince the king to do what's right. That just seems so, so terrible. And yet, today we know that religious leaders and political leaders are making all kinds of mistakes and we will suffer the consequences. Help us to be faithful like those few in Israel that remain faithful to God is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.